Hi everyone. We are on chapter 16 of the doldrums. Dun dun dun. All right. The wind blew leaves from the trees and howled across the roofs as the sun rose over Willow Street. It was the morning of the escape. Archer, Oliver, and Adelaide went about their separate business. Adelaide left her bag by the door and stepped into the kitchen. She scooped a heap of dog food from a sack. sack. Her, feather was, her father was rummaging through the cabinets. Have you seen my espresso cups and spoons, Addie? he asked. I haven't, she replied, and poured the food into a bowl. A dirty Fritz galloped in through the garden doors and plopped his face into the bowl. Adelaide stared at her father, unsure what to say, but knowing she couldn't leave without saying anything. I'll be going away for a while, she said, as her father bent down to check beneath the sink, but it shouldn't be too long. That's nice, said Mr. Belmont, straightening himself and pressing his hands to his back. Where could they have gone, he mumbled. Across the gardens, Oliver was having a difficult time finishing his breakfast. He'd been up late the night before, trying to figure out everything that could go wrong, but the list went on and on, and his head cramped, and he fell asleep on his desk. You're barely eating a thing, said Mrs. Glubb. Less to lose later, said Oliver. Mr. Glubb poured himself a large cup of coffee and sat down. Are you planning on losing it, he asked. I don't know what I'm planning on, said Oliver. Next door, Archer was having a much easier time finishing his breakfast. You'd never know it by looking at him. But he was bursting with excitement. He was finally about to do something great. Mr. Helmsley had left for work, and his mother was seated across from him. He finished his breakfast and told her he'd be upstairs reading while the rest of his class was at the museum. And he grabbed the badger on his way up the stairs. Where are you taking me? asked the badger. I need you to be I need you to be me, said Archer. I'd rather eat hot coals than be you, said the ostrich when Archer came back for the fox. Archer nodded. We finally agree on something, he replied. Archer shut his bedroom door. Oliver was on the balcony. He stepped into the room. Archer pulled aside his bed sheets and placed the badger in the fox head to toe. What do you think your mother will do when she finds out, Oliver asked. I don't know, he replied, but we have to get to Rosewood Port before she does. We'll have time. Archer scribbled two notes. One he gave to Oliver, who turned it into an airplane and sent it to Adelaide. The other was a letter of explanation to his parents. He placed that lever, letter in the badger's paw before pulling the covers over its head. Archer and Oliver climbed the ladder to the roof, took one final look into the gardens, and ducked into Oliver's house. Archer waited just inside the front door for Oliver's, Oliver's signal before slipping out of his house. The wind whirled down the sidewalk. Adelaide's hair, which usually fell neatly across her forehead, was swirling with it every which way all at once. Oliver thought she looked like a madwoman, but he and Archer were glad to see her. The crocodile girl, girl gave them confidence and a chocolate croissant each. They finished them before arriving at the button factory. Students were assembled on the front steps. Mrs. Merkley towered over them, keeping a watchful eye. School trips are supposed to be exciting affairs, but the students' expressions would make you think otherwise. I don't think we're going to the museum, said Charlie H. Brimble. She's probably taking us to Rosewood Cliffs to hurl us into the ocean. Let's pretend to be sick, said Molly S. Mellings. I don't have to pretend, said Alice P. Suggins. Archer, Oliver, and Adelaide joined the miserable group and stood as far from Mrs. Merkley as they could. Archer opened his notebook to review the plan one last time. The first step was to sneak away during their tour of the museum. Archer would go first, followed by Adelaide, and Oliver would pull up the rear. They would meet next to tap and scutes with their masks in place, and once they were all together, make for the back exit in Rosewood Park. After winding their way through the unruly park, they would follow the canal to Rosewood Port, where they would wait for the guard to leave his booth. Then they would locate Dock E7, where hopefully the research vessel would still be loading cargo. They would climb atop a pallet and wait to be loaded onto the ship. Once aboard, they would find a place to hide until the ship was too far out to sea to turn back. Adelaide had packed enough food to last them three days. After that, they would make themselves known. Archer would ask to speak to the ship's captain and would explain why they were there and what they came to do. And whether the captain liked it or not, they would be on their way to Antarctica. That was the plan. Mrs. Merkley ordered the class into two lines, and they followed her down the sidewalk 
sidewalk into Rosewood Park and up the museum steps. The students pushed through the museum doors and stared with eyes wide at the brilliant Great Hall. It was massive, with all manner of beasts and insects and ornate murals. Everyone began whispering. Archer was quiet. Mrs. Merkley approached the counter to get their tickets. I'll need 16, she said, but was handed 32. And what's this, she huffed, eyeing the extras. We're currently in partnership with the Rosewood Zoo, chirped the woman behind the counter. Each week they bring a different species of animal into our special exhibit space and discuss the creatures. You will then be able to see displays about the animal's evolution and historical significance elsewhere in the museum. Everyone will love it. All the classes have. Very well, said Mrs. Merkley, making it quite clear she wouldn't love it. And what's this week's creature? Newitz? Tigers. Mrs. Merkley glanced over her shoulder at Archer, Adelaide, and Oliver, who were, who were all too busy staring around the Great Hall to notice. Tigers, she mumbled. Perfect. With the tickets in hand, Mrs. Merkley barked, and the students followed her down the corridor to the special exhibit space. Archer grabbed three maps from the counter and handed one to Oliver and one to Adelaide. This is where Tappancus is, he said, circling the spot on both their maps with a pen. He looked at Mrs. Merkley. She didn't know where she was going. He nodded, pulled his bag tight, and gave his friends an uncertain smile. This is it, this is it he said. I'll see you on the other side. Archer dashed into the Hall of Reptiles and put on his badger mask. Mrs. Merkley didn't see a thing. The class turned a corner and continued down another corridor. Oliver was growing pale. Don't worry, said Adelaide, placing a hand on his shoulder. You'll be brilliant. She hesitated a moment, then clomped down the Hall of Night Creatures while securing her lion mask. Oliver continued on alone, and that's exactly how he felt. Archer hurried down a corridor and entered the Egyptian wing to take his position next to Tappancuse. He felt strange with everyone staring at him as he pushed the badger mask up on his head. While he waited for Adelaide, he unzipped his bag and pulled out the jade elephant house. He was thinking about his grandparents when Adelaide tapped his shoulders. He nearly screamed. Sorry, she said, lifting her lion mask. It's a little difficult to see in these, isn't it? I thought so too, he replied, and everyone was staring at me. They fell silent. Both of them were anxious to escape the museum and began looking around the room, hoping Oliver wouldn't be far behind. The students arrived at the special exhibit space as expected. Oliver was still with them, which was unexpected. He'd been too afraid to leave and didn't know what to do. Mrs. Merkley began handing out the special exhibit tickets, but had two left over. All right, she growled. Who doesn't have a ticket? Uh-oh, no one said anything. Hold up your tickets. Everyone had a ticket. Mrs. Merkley scanned the group and spotted Oliver standing alone. He wasn't alone when they began. He was never alone. You, she barked. Where are your comrades? Oliver was panting on the inside, but tried his best to look calm. Who, me, he asked. They're not with me. Please don't put me on your list. Mrs. Merkley plowed toward him, looking as though she might hurl him into the hall of in invertebrates. Oliver thought about running, but froze instead. I can see they're not with you, she snapped, but they were with you when we started, and if you don't tell me where they are, you'll be with them on my list. Oliver's inner tur turmoil overtook his outer calm, but he couldn't betray Archer and Adelaide. He had to stick to the plan. They're in the bathroom, he said, wishing they'd thought up a better excuse. If you give me their tickets, I can wait here and... <gasps> they're going to Antarctica, Charlie Brimbled shouted. Mr. Merkley glared at him. Charlie shrank. At least I think they are. That's impossible, said Oliver. Mrs. Merkley grabbed Oliver by the shoulders and ushered him into the special exhibit room. Once everyone else was inside, she threw the tickets at the guard and said, none of them are to leave. And then she stormed off in search of trouble. Whoa. All right. Stay tuned.